So, um, how many of you have found that the Freedom Series is doing something in you? This Freedom Series, is it? Are we on track? All right. Well, we're going to go a little bit deeper this morning, and we're going to look at the mother wound. We're going to look at the mother wound, and I believe that I'm speaking to a number of people here. The first group, it's mothers or potential mothers. And this message will help you to understand what the role of a mother is. The other group is those of you who've been mothered or haven't been mothered, which is everyone else in the room. Amen. Because this message will help you to see the gaps, cracks, and leakages in your life where you need to release your mother and forgive your mother for certain gaps that are there in your life. Amen. And it's also for a third group, counselors. Those who bring healing to people. How many of you are counselors? How many of you counsel people? Even if it's your friends. All right? All right. A lot of us in this room. And it's important to understand mother wounds because very often mother wounds are extremely subtle. Mother wounds, you see, are very difficult to deal with, especially for a lot of men out there. Because somehow in the psyche of a man, the way you are raised is at a certain point as you grow older and older, you must protect your mom. And you can't say anything negative about your mom because of all the sacrifices that she made. And so we go through life looking at our hearts, trying to figure out where's that wound in my life and we never think that there's a mother wound. Are you hearing me this morning? Sometimes simply because our mothers carried us in their womb. How many of you were spent nine months, about nine months in a womb? <laughs> Guaranteed, 100% response. And sometimes just because of that, doesn't matter what anything, it doesn't matter anything else our moms did or didn't do, just because of that, we just, we're grateful. We're like, oh, she carried me. And some moms remind you of that. I carried you. I gave up my career, right? And I believe that we're going to expose the enemy's strategy this morning. We're going to expose these wounds so that the wound can be healed. Because this one is very, very subtle. So many people are rejected by their mothers. And when I talk about the rejection of a mother, please, I'm not always saying your mother did something wrong to you. This is what a lot of people don't understand about wounds. How many of you know that you can hurt someone by accident, they're still hurt? How many of you know that you can be driving your car innocently, not doing anything, you are not doing anything illegal, you are just driving your car and by mistake someone jumps in front of you and you run them over. It was a mistake on your part but they still remain wounded. And so when we're talking about mother wounds, we're not necessarily saying your mother intentionally did something wrong because very often a child is wounded because of how that child interprets the situation. Are you hearing me this morning? So, for example, your mother could feel inadequate raising you. And she might say, I think you'll have better conditions if you go to auntie so-and-so. You, as a child, might not be able to interpret her intention. You might just see it as, my mother didn't love me. So my mother dumped me at my aunt's. Amen? And when you're much older, you can feel like, wow, I think she did it for my own good because of the conditions we are living in. But because you were a child at that point, you didn't view it that way. And your personality is formed in those first few years of your life. And so you saw that act as abandonment. Maybe you lived in a remote area where there were no good schools. So at the age of five, you were sent to boarding school. In your mind, you could not understand why did they do this to me? Do they not enjoy my presence? Do they not enjoy my company? You're still left wounded with a strong root of rejection. Are you hearing me, ladies and gentlemen, this morning? Many people have been rejected by their mothers. And very often it's been enabled by grandparents who take on mothering responsibilities. Where it's like, no, 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 I need this child. Culturally, we know. In a lot of our cultures on the African continent, when people have had a number of kids and then grandma has had all her kids and hasn't got anyone to look after her, what happens? Oh, let me take this one. This one will stay with me. And sometimes there's rejection that's communicated through that. Why was I the one who went to the rural area to stay with grandma while the, my other siblings stayed in the town and went to the nicer school? How many of you are feeling me this morning? People interpret it as rejection. 
a wound of rejection. There's a man I spoke to a few days ago. He's 32 years of age. And I was just asking him about his life. And I said, are you married? Have you got kids? He says, yes, I've got a wife and I've got a child. And then he says, but technically speaking, I've actually got two kids because I raised my nephew. That's what he said to me. He said, I raised my nephew. He says, my nephew is 20 years of age and I'm 32, but I raised him. And I said to him, let me just get into your world. What actually happened? Well, this was my sister's son. And my sister had him with a boyfriend or someone. Had him. But then she would sort of sometimes be at home and then sometimes she would go off to this guy she wasn't married to. And we see that happening a lot in this nation, don't we? Where we see women having kids and they leave the child with their brother, with their sister, with their mother, and they go off. And sometimes it happens because they feel like their worth is less in, an eye, in, the, in the eyes of a man if they've got a child already. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We even see it when it comes to, and we joke about it, when it comes to paying lobola. And you see some people, they'll charge a lot because of the number of degrees their daughter has got. And then if the daughter has already got a child with someone else, sometimes it's like, okay, uh, this person has been damaged here, yeah, damaged goods, let's lessen the amount. And so the mindset in the psyche of a lot of women is, because I've already got this child, come on, there are lots of single moms, we've got single moms here, right? Because I've already got a, a child, it decreases the chance of me getting a guy. Because maybe life will be complicated. And so let me act like I don't have a child and that child is rejected. There are many mothers today rejecting their children. 43% of children beneath the ages of 0 and 4 are living with a single mom. 43% are in that situation. And it must be very tricky for those single moms. Single moms, yeah, I don't know how you cope. Because you're trying to provide for your child at the same time you want to be there for your child. Not easy. And these are issues we need to address. And in fact, at a certain point, I'm actually going to do a specific seminar just for single moms. Because a lot of times single moms come and they hear us talking about this, talking about that. And they, they feel like, yes, but what about my situation? Come on, single moms here. How many single moms do we have here? There's no shame in it. It could be for various reasons. Okay, we've got a few, right? And that's what this guy said to me. There's so much rejection that's there. Then he goes on to talk about his own life. And he says, I only knew my father when I was 17. And between the ages of 17 and 32, I've only met him a few times. He says, when I was growing up, I would try and meet with him. And my, my dad always thought that I wanted something from him. And he would say, e, I haven't got money. E, I haven't got money. Then he says to me, even now that I'm a grown man, I'm working, I get paid a salary. When I try to see him just to connect with him, he's like, e, my son, I don't have money. I don't have money. And he says, I'm not wanting your money. I'm just wanting to know you and connect with you. So there's rejection, yes, from fathers, but there's the mother rejection that we need to begin to talk about and we'll continue also next week. Now, apart from the common use of mother that we all know, it's interesting because if you look in the Greek, it's the word mater in the Greek. It's where we get terms like metropolitan or metropolit met metropolis, all right, which is mother city or mother state. It's where we get that term. And it's the word mater. And it's a strong word, isn't it? And it's interesting because it's actually got some similarities to the word father. It actually speaks of source, where something comes from. Amen. Can someone close one of these doors here? It's quite a bit of noise coming through. All right. It speaks of that. It speaks of mater. In some languages, you've got a similar term. In German, in German, it's mutter. In Dutch, moida. Right? In Latin, mater. And it's a strong word. And when we look at it, we should understand that in God's, from God's perspective, he weighs heavily the concept of motherhood. And that's why when we say this is the metropolis, we're talking about the founding city, aren't we? When we say the mother city, when we talk about Cape Town, the founding city, the first city, 
in the area. And when we're talking about it, we're talking about an environment that's very distinguished compared to the rural areas around it. That's what we're talking about. And so from God's perspective, the concept of mother is a very strong concept. It's not just some side thing that is arbitrary. And what I find very interesting is if you look in the Hebrew, the word for mother is also a word that is used to speak of binding something and gluing something together. And that's why we know that the mother in a family often is described as the glue of the family. One who brings things together. Are you hearing me this morning? And so those of you who are saying, I want to be a good mother, my question to you is, do you see the weight of motherhood? Mater. And do you play the role of mothering where you bring things together, where you bind the family together? Are you hearing me this morning, ladies and gentlemen? It's a large responsibility. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is very interesting because what we've seen is that there's a sequence. There's a sequence which you, you go through in your life. And so you find yourself needing to bond with your mother. But at a certain point, as you can see from this scripture, there's also the process of leaving. And you see that a lot of people have got gaps when it comes to the degree to which they bonded with their moms. And then there are a lot of people who have gaps when it comes to the degree to which they actually leave their moms. So we have a problem when it comes to untying ourselves from our moms and starting our own families. And so there's dysfunction in a lot of homes today. There's sexual dysfunction in a lot of places today. Some people's heads went up when I said sexual. It's like that word just triggered something in you. <laughs> Don't know what was happening in your subconscious there. When I went sexual. <laughs> All right. Anyway. A lot of people are experiencing family dysfunction and sexual dysfunction because they haven't fully left mom. And they're trying to relate to their spouse like their spouse is their mother. And that's why we say, gentlemen, your wife ain't your? Your wife ain't your? Your wife ain't your? Yes. <laughs> your wife ain't your mama. All right? And so we see this happening in this sequence. Often there is dysfunction when it comes to bonding and when it comes to separation. You know that when there's no true leaving of mom and dad, there'll be no real cleaving to your spouse. You see, mother wounds are very subtle because we find it hard to admit them. Often when I'm counseling people, you'll hear people saying, my mom did this, this, this and this and this. And then they're very quick to minimize what their mom did. Straight afterwards. My mom, I felt hurt because of this. But I know she was trying. But I know she was... Blah, blah, blah. No, that's what she did. Knowingly or unknowingly. She wasn't perfect. Amen? And it's time we acknowledge the mother wounds. It's time we acknowledge the mother wounds. Mark chapter 7 verse 10 I want you to see here the weight of a mother the weight of the role of mothering because you see some of you you want to accomplish great things in your destiny and you've made the whole thing of mothering the side issue like hi ah, yeah it's just on the side it'll just happen naturally look how God views the role of mother look what he look what he says for Moses said honor what does that mean? Revere and revere with tenderness of feeling and deference. Your father, and not really your mother, and, and to a lesser extent your mother? No, your father and mother. And he who curses or reviles or speaks evil of or abuses or treats improperly his father or mother... Let him surely die. Please note, it doesn't say he who speaks improperly of his pastor, let him die. Of his priest, let him die. It doesn't say that. But it says he who does that to his mother or father, let him die. Now for me, it shows me that in God's mind, the role of mother weighs heavily. Is everyone following that? My question to you is, does it play that same role in your life as one who wants to mother? as one who's currently mothering? Is it something that's of primary importance to you? 
Or is it a side thing where the main thing is me and my career and me and my ambitions and then the mothering thing is this thing in the corner? And I'll tell you what, if we don't have this right in terms of how we weigh heavily, that's honor, by the way. That's what I'm saying, weigh heavily. It's the word kabod. It's to weigh something heavily. That's, that's the word honor. If we don't do that, it results in rejection and pain in our children. If we don't have the right belief about mothering, it will result in rejection, pain, wounding, and abandonment in our children. And our children will pick up on it. They pick up on it. In Exodus, Exodus chapter 21, verse 15, it says, Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If you're in this room and you've ever done that, we, we, we break something off you. Because that's one of, the, one of the reasons that causes people to be cursed in their lives. You know, people say, but I'm in Christ now, so I'm uncursable. Yes, but you need to renounce that particular thing and the impact it has on your life. It says, whoever strikes his mother or father shall surely be put to death. Does it say, whoever strikes his father only? No, it says, father or mother shall surely be put to death. That's why if my, if my children say something to my wife, that is dishonoring. If they don't listen to her first time, if they show dishonor to their mother, for me it's a very serious thing. I'm trying to show you this morning the weight of motherhood. Because we live in a society that has downplayed being a mother. We live in a society where if someone decides or chooses that they're going to be a stay-at-home mom, there's a sense of shame associated with it. And you've got family members saying, why aren't you working? But you must work. And we've taken a hold of the world's way of thinking concerning mothering, which is wrong. And I'm hoping this nation, somehow or another, this message gets into the nation. Amen? Proverbs 20, verse 20. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in complete darkness. So what's the biblical portrait of a mother? What's the big biblical picture of a mother? Some of you are planning to get married quite soon. You must think about this. Some of you are trying for kids. You must think about this. The biblical portrait of a mother. What the Bible says a mother ought to be and ought to do. Do you want to hear that? We're just going to go to the word. Not to what modern day society is trying to tell us. You see, it's important for women to understand their role as mother. You are not called to mother your husband. The needs of your children are not the same as the needs of your husband. Too many women today have, do what we call enmeshment. It's where you just lump everything together. So too many women today, please receive this and hear my heart, they think, okay, I fed my family. That means I've, I've, I've met their needs. It doesn't always work that way. There's a need to feed your family in terms of your children. And your husband, yes, also obviously needs to be fed. But how many of you know that those aren't your husband's primary needs? Someone, someone isn't getting this. So there's your role as, your, as a wife, and then there's a role as a mother. And the two aren't the same. We need to understand that. Let's, let's just go a bit, a bit deeper into this. You see, a lot of men today are looking for needs to be met by their wives that only a mother can give. So a lot of men today who've got mother wounds, where they were abandoned by their mom, where they didn't bond with their mom, when they look at a female... They don't realize that the thing that is pulling them toward that female isn't their attraction to her and their love for her. It's that need for the maternal bond that was not met by the mom. And what happens is they then get married and this woman feels she's never good enough because they're like, oh, but you didn't feed me. You didn't give me my food today. You forgot to, to make my lunchbox. How come you forgot? You forgot to make my lunchbox. You can go and buy KFC. You can go and buy takeaways. The, her primary role isn't making your lunchbox. 
are you fo- are you following me? Now you can arrange that and you can say that's the role, but sometimes the reaction from certain men, you see that it's an infantile response. Because it's a man who never bonded and was not nurtured by the mom, by his mom, and now is looking for a mother in his wife. And when you understand that, that there's that bondage that you're facing, you break it off yourself, and when you make requests of your from your of your wife, they're requests that are reasonable. And when she doesn't fulfill them, you don't react like a baby who hasn't been breastfed. You laugh, but it's happening today in marriages. And it's so liberating when the man understands that, wait a minute, this is an infantile response. Oh, she had a difficult day. Oh, she couldn't do this. Oh, she cooked late. Oh, she forgot to get this. And it's okay. I forget to do some things from time to time. Amen? Amen. We need to understand this if we want to come to a place of freedom in our lives. So when we look at the biblical portrait of a mother, the first aspect I want to highlight is the role of homemaker. It's not what... It's not what modern day society is teaching. I want to encourage you guys with the sermons we're doing at the moment. We've got very powerful prayer strategies that Pastor Vim is creating. She's already done the prayer strategy for this message. So if you want to pray deeper into these things, please, by Monday morning, they're up. They're up on the website, the prayer strategies, and we can really pray. Amen. The role of what? Homemaker. You can't say, I want to be a mother, but then I don't like doing things around the house. That's not what modern day society is teaching. Amen? You see, for some of you, your epistemology, how you know what you know, isn't based on the word of God. It's based on something else, what people are teaching nowadays. I know I'm different. No, your problem is you've been cut off your femininity. You've got a wound, and sometimes it's a mother wound. You see, what mother wounds do is you either, it causes you to either reject everything feminine because of the wound you have in terms of what your mom didn't do, or you strive in life looking for that femininity and embracing it, and you're looking, looking, looking. And a lot of women are cut off from their femininity because of a mother wound. Is everyone following? Because of a mother wound. And so they react strongly to any suggestion that they can do certain things and take pride in their home. So we live in a society today where that's frowned upon. And a lot of women are marrying men who they believe will be able to look after the house. In other words, men who are homemakers. And we see a dysfunction there. Are you following? All right? So... We find Paul saying to Titus something very interesting. And we look at Titus chapter 2, and we're going to look from verse 4 to 5. Titus chapter 2, and we're going to look from verse 4 to 5. Then they can urge, and it's talking about older women. Who's an older woman here? It's all relative. You can be 30 and you're older than a 29-year-old, okay? Okay. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands. That's one of the roles of a homemaker, to love their husbands and children. You know what's interesting about that? It actually uses in the Greek two different words. It uses two different words. One for loving your husband and another one for loving your child. Because it's two types of love. Which is interesting for me. Okay, It has the root word phileo, which is family love. Right? But one of the words is the phileo toward a man, and the other one is phileo toward a child. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> see, one is philandros, which is phileo toward a man, love of man. And the other one is philotechnus. Technon in Greek is child. Right? And love of, of towards a child. <clears throat> Instead of enmeshing the two. So then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. To be self-controlled. In other words, to know how to control your appetites. To control yourself. Right? And pure. I and mean, then look at that next phrase. 
This is, this is what we translate to homemaker. It says, to be busy where? To be busy where? To be busy where? Right. So you can't say I'm a mother, but you're never at home. We'll let that sink for a while. I don't mind. The Bible says, do not be ashamed of me and of my teaching. I'm not ashamed of this teaching. Amen. Right? Ask yourself, mothers, are there things in my life, dreams I have, that are keeping me busy elsewhere and are taking away from my busyness in household affairs? If you want to be an ordinary mother, that's fine. But if you want to be a kingdom mother, look at this. It says here, to be busy at home. That's the word homemaker. To be kind and to be subject to their husbands. That talks about submission. That talks about right relation. Right relations with your spouse. So that no one will malign the word of God. The word of God is being maligned today because people look at how we manage our households. And we can say to them however many times we want, come to church, come to church. But they're looking and they're saying, but how are you governing your family? How are you governing your children? Another translation of verse 5 reads, to be self-controlled, chaste, homemakers, good-natured, kind-hearted, adapting and subordinating themselves to their husbands. I like that one, adapting. Okay. Dari, the Bible says a lot of things about what men should do. Okay. We spoke about that a couple of weeks ago, right? Now, whenever you interpret scripture and you look at a Greek word, so that one which we've looked at that speaks about being domestically inclined, that's that word, okay? It's it's actually an interesting word. In the Greek, it's two words joined together. It's oikos and ergon. Ergon speaks of how many of you have read my book, Business God's Way, where I've got a biblical view of work? Ergon is one of the words that speaks of work. And oikos is family. So that word that speaks of being a homemaker, it's basically working at home. It's talking about homework. Work that happens at home. Is everyone following? Right. So it basically is extremely powerful when you unpack the word. But whenever you look at a Greek word, also say to yourself, where was the person from who used that word? Because a lot of the New Testament is written in Greek, isn't it? But it's written by people from where? It's written by Hebraic people who are using Greek. So it's useful saying, what was happening in that Hebraic mindset? Is everyone following? In that Hebrew person's mind when they use that word homemaker. And I'll tell you what was happening in Paul's mind. Because if you look in the Hebrew, the word that's used for keeper, it's the word keeper. It's the word shamar. It's a very powerful word. And it actually means the following. It means to plant a hedge about as in thorns that protect being the keeper of something. And so when it says housekeeper or homemaker, it's talking about home watchman. So it's beyond domestic affairs. It is now talking about the watchman role. It's the same word that is used for a watchman. It's one who is attentive to impending danger. It's one who says winter is about to come. Are the children warm? Let's go and buy jerseys for them. And in the process, get boots for myself. <laughs> and nice funky winter wear for myself. <laughs> if you're like most moms out there. But the point I'm making is that in the Hebrews mindset, a homekeeper is a watchman for a house. A watchman over the family. Isn't that powerful? God has called you women to watch your families and watch over your children. It means to be circumspect, to look carefully, to observe and watch, to know what's going on in your household. We see therefore that the understanding of keeper in the Hebrew culture is more about the calling of a watchman on the wall of intercession than it is just to do with household chores. So a mother is to pray for her family. I think that's so powerful. If you feel like clapping, please just go ahead. <laughs> 
I was half joking. In the book of Psalms 121 verse 5, it says, the Lord is your keeper. So what does he do? The Lord is your shade on your right hand. That's the side that is not carrying a shield. So you've got your own shield here on the left, but the Lord is your shade on your right hand. Isn't that powerful? A keeper is aware of impending danger. This is the watchman role of the mother. Proverbs 31, I'm going to read verse 15. I'm going to read verse 21. I'm going to read verse 27. We love the Proverbs 31 woman, don't we? She was a homemaker. Please, she was an, she was an entrepreneur in business gods where I've got a chapter there on entrepreneurship and I use her as an example of an entrepreneur and I say that your business should not take you away from your family responsibilities this Proverbs 31 woman who we admire so much what does the Bible say about what she did because many of you say I want to be a Proverbs 31 mom okay let's have a look let's unpack it and just receive the word of God verse 15 it says she gets up while it is still what is, while it's still night that's not very difficult to do in winter right now, right? <laughs> she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family. It doesn't say she does all the cooking herself. But she makes sure it happens. So one of the roles of a mother is what? Feeding. Making sure the feeding happens, yes. And it can either be supervisory or you doing it hands on. I'm seeing one of my sisters over there is excited about the supervisory aspect of it. <laughs> Mothers, your children shouldn't be sitting at home wondering, when is, what are we going to eat? When is the food going to come? There must be a plan. Amen? My, my wife feeds us a lot at home. I got to a point where I actually said, my love, you know what? When you do the cereal for us in the morning, I'm noticing the kids and myself, we tend to leave some. We, we, we don't finish all of it. Can you cut down on the amounts you're giving us? I don't know if she grew up with men in her life who ate uh, large portions. I don't know where it comes from, okay? But she says, you know what? I'm a feeder. I'm a feeder. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> At home, I'm always just getting stuff, getting stuff. It just keeps coming, keeps coming. But what does it say here? It says, she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family. And I love this. And portions for her female servants. Make sure that the people who live on your property, the people who work for you, make sure they're also fed. Let's not be stingy. That's Proverbs 31, if you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman. And then look at verse 21. It says, when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. In other words, they are warm during winter. It's not like you've got the fanciest coat in the house and you're warm and your kids are walking around. Duh, 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 duh. Hello, mama, hello, mama. And you've got this fancy coat. Blankets during winter. Amen? So she makes sure that her family is fed, clothed warmly, and she manages the affairs of the household. She's also not lazy about it. She's on top of things at home. Look at verse 27. It says, she watches over what? The affairs of her household. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread off of idleness so she's not lazy and she knows the details of what's going on in a household if you challenge a lot of moms today a lot of women today in South Africa and you say do you know what's going on at home I remember coaching a particular lady very strong character in one of the banks and I noticed she would push up her fiery red that strong side that gets things done and I said you're pushing it up a lot what are things like at home she says, there are a lot of things, Paul, that are left undone at home. She was using a lot of her energy to bring her best to work. And things were left undone at home. The Bible here is talking about motherhood. And it's saying that you manage well the affairs of your household. You know what's going on. 
Now here's an example of the opposite. In Job 39 verse 16, it says, she is hardened against her young ones. I said yesterday at the couple's breakfast, there are things that harden us in life. If a woman has been treated badly by the mother of her children, it can harden her. And the sad thing is sometimes she can take it out on her kids. It says here, she is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Do you sometimes, mothers in this place, feel hardened towards your children as if they were not yours? As though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain because she has no sense of danger for her unborn brood. She has no sense of danger. One of the things about a mother as a watchman is they have a sense of danger. Sometimes I believe it's actually an intuitive sense that God has given you moms where you know when danger is coming and you protect your young ones. Amen? So that's the first aspect of a mother. We're talking about a biblical portrait of a mother and that's the homemaker. Number two, the role of teacher. Very often we emphasize that father you should teach. Father, you should teach your family. And that's important. And that's one of the father's primary roles. But how many of you know that the mother also has a role to teach? Because when it comes to accessibility and approachability, a mother is there day to day with her kids. More often than most fathers. Not so? And I look in scripture and I cannot avoid seeing passages of scripture that talk about the mother teaching her children in particular. In Proverbs 1 verse 8, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Proverbs 31, we love this. And it's amazing because there's this king, Lemuel. And I find it interesting what he says. In verse 1, it says, The words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his, which his mother taught him, so you read Proverbs 31 and you're just thinking, oh, the words of a wise king. But who taught him that wisdom? The mother. And it's interesting because he didn't let go the teaching of his mother. It says, yeah, what, O oh my son, and what, O oh my O oh son of my womb, and what, O oh son of my vows? Verse 3. This is what he was taught by his mother. Do not spend your strength on women. Do you know what promiscuity does? Do you know what womanizing does? It weakens you as a man. W w men who go around from woman to woman are actually weakening their own manhood. They're doing it to feel more like a man, but they're weakening their manhood. And that's why we see here in scripture, it says, do not spend your strength on women. Do you know what also weakens a man? What weakened King Solomon? When you have many wives, it weakens you. The, gentlemen, those of you who are married, what is it like looking after one wife? What is it like being tender to one wife? What is it like figuring out one wife? I don't know. I don't know how someone has lots of wives and is also able to be a king like Solomon or president but I'm run how do you how do you run <laughs> think about it can i tell you what happens something has to give either a nation or some of the women god's plan was not polygamy god's original plan in the beginning he says, I'm going to give you a helper, singular, suitable for you, singular. It was because of the hardness of people's hearts that they were like, oh, I can also get another one and another one. Oh, and there's another one. This was the wisdom of the mother. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who do what to kings, on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings. This is all coming from the mother. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. It is not for rulers to crave beer. 
you want to be an average person or do you want to be a king? This is wisdom from the mother. Speak up. This is verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. So we see that King Lemuel got teaching from his mother that he didn't let go of. His mother taught him about women. His mother taught him about the dangers of drinking habits. And his mother taught him about justice issues. Now, if this mother could teach a potential king, why are we stopping women from teaching people? Why are we stopping women from teaching people when this mother had such profound influence on this king? Teachings that he didn't let go of. Mothers in this place, you've got the role of teacher. You've got the role of homemaker. You've got the role of teacher. And some of you have been wounded because your moms were not there for you as homemaker. Some of you have been wounded because your moms were not there for you to instruct you and teach you certain things. Because they would see you. Maybe your dad was away at work, but they would see you as you're going. They would see you as you took interest in that girl. But they didn't teach you. They just thought, hey, yeah, it could be covered by the men. Hey, my husband should do it. My husband should do it. But he wasn't there to see what was going on. And maybe he was dubious himself. Number three, accessibility and approachability. Accessibility and approachability. A mother must be accessible. A mother must be what? Accessible. When a child falls and injures himself and starts to cry, where does he, who does he want? It doesn't matter how tough my boys think they are. I could be standing there. I could be there playing with them. What happens when they're injured? My wife could be in the house. They'll walk past me. Ooh, 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 and they go to who? To mom. Because the way she's been wired is she's wired as a nurturer. And we'll talk about nurturing right now, just now. But in order to play that role, you must be accessible. Understand that the way a guy is wired is different. If my kids get injured, what do I say to them? Okay, so what have you learned? What have you learned about trying... <laughs> Okay, what have you learned about trying to jump off from a wall and going onto a trampoline? What are you learning? Yeah, you see, guys, so this is what I've been trying to tell you. It's because you didn't listen. There's no empathy. When they run to my wife, it doesn't matter what they had done to hurt themselves. What does my wife do? Oh, and then she looks at the wound. Oh, oh it's so big. Oh, let me do this. And then they stop crying. Now, some of you didn't get that from your moms because they were not accessible. Do you know the pain a child goes through when they're crying injured, whether at school or at home or wherever, and they need to bond with the mom. They know that my mom will feel for me. But if mom is not accessible, there's a wound. Now, you're saying to me, but Paul, how do we then deal with it? Because we are working, we are doing this, we are doing that. It doesn't matter the fact that you're working. I'm talking about how kids get wounded. And the little child doesn't interpret it as, but I understand because mom is working because she needs to make cash because things are tough because dad doesn't earn that much. Child doesn't interpret it that way. The wound is still there. And when you understand that the wound is there, you come up with strategies to make sure that they're still bonding, they're still nurturing, there's still accessibility despite your current conditions. Amen. So please don't say to me afterwards, yeah, but then what do I do because this is my situation. Sometimes you're in that situation because of mammon. Do you know what mammon does? Mammon is the demonic spirit that controls the use of money and materialism. You know what mammon does? It wants us to ultimately believe we don't need God. That's why the Bible says you cannot serve both God and mammon. The spirit of mammon causes you to get to a place where you feel like it's my source. And as long as I've got money, I'll be happy. And so you see a lot of moms today making all sorts of career decisions that take them further and further away from their family because they're controlled by a demonic spirit, a principality that's very strong in this region called mammon. One of the ways you break that spirit over your life is where you make a decision and you say, but how is it going to affect my mothering of my children? I 
I've seen a lot of people who've made certain decisions based on kingdom principles and God has prospered them. He's prospered them because they didn't trust in riches. They didn't trust in mammon, but they came up with a model that would ensure that they would still effectively mother their children. Amen. Accessibility and approachability. Isaiah 49 verses 15 to 16. And the Lord answered, can a woman forget her nursing child? You can see that in the mind of God, the way he created a mother is that a mother should not forget her nursing child. What do we mean by nursing child? We're talking about that baby you are bonding with, that baby you are breastfeeding. How do you breastfeed but you forget at the same time? I was doing a workshop a couple of weeks ago and there was a lady who said, Paul, I'm going to be in and out because I'm expressing at the moment. You all know what expressing is, right? Okay. Uh, she was expressing. She had to express her breast milk so that her child at the end of the day has enough breast milk, right? So she's like, I'm expressing. And because I've, I've been a parent and so on, I understand that person. I was like, that's fine. I said, that's really important. Go and do it. You'll be in and out of the session. God designed certain things, even in our anatomy, so that we can bond with our children. And that's one of the things breastfeeding does. And sometimes for some people, they grew up in situations where their moms couldn't breastfeed them. Physically, there was some kind of health issue and so on. It happens. But there's still some degree of bonding that can happen, whether you're bottle feeding and you're nurturing your child that way. But sometimes when there's no breastfeeding, there is a gap, eh? Because God designed it for the purpose of bonding mother and child. There's someone who I coach who would say to me, she has, she has challenges, she's got two boys, and one of them is the older one. Obviously, one of them is the older one, okay? But the older one, she struggled to bond with him. And she says, you know what? I never bonded with him. How many of you moms are feeling me? Where sometimes with some of your kids, you can look back and just say, I bonded in the early stage with these two, but with this one, we didn't bond. And now we've got these challenges. God says, can a woman forget her nursing child? When a mother forgets her children, there's a wound. Ladies, don't get so caught up in your careers that you forget your children. That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. That's one of the things about the love of a mother, isn't it? It's full of compassion. That's why sometimes when you're disciplining your child, that's why father and mother working together, it helps. Because the father can step in and say, you know what, it's fine, he must learn. The mother is the one who says, but he forgot his lunchbox. No, you'll get hungry, you'll borrow, he'll do something. No, but I'm going to just, just one more time, I'm going to take it back to school for him. No, he forgot this. No, he forgot. That's the compassion of a mother. Has your heart become hardened towards your children? Was your mother like that to you where her heart became hardened because of what she was going through, maybe because of what your father was doing to her? And then this is what God says. Isn't this powerful? Yes, they may forget. Some of you here with those mother wounds. Yes, they may forget. Yet I will not forget. That's the good news. There's the nurturing aspect of Father God where he's always accessible. Even when your mom wasn't. He fills in the gap. Even where your mom wasn't there. Isn't that powerful? In Exodus chapter 2 verse 8. Isn't it interesting? You have Pharaoh's daughter. And what does she say? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go, see the girl went and called the child's mother. Why didn't the girl go and call the, fa the father of the child? Mothers are accessible. I talk about this when I talk about leadership. And I say, leaders should be accessible and approachable. Mothers should be accessible and approachable. I remember one lady in one of my sessions, she said, you know what, guys? I never see my boss. He says, seriously, I don't see him. He's always either in a meeting or working from home. I don't see my boss. Sadly, there are many children saying that concerning their mothers today. I don't see mom. Moms, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, hey? If you start feeling guilty based on this message, that's on you. It's not on me. I'm telling you the role of a mother biblically. And then together we can figure out how we can do that. Amen? I'm trying to show you what the gaps, cracks, and leakages are in your life 
because of what your mom didn't do. That's what my duty is today. Accessibility and approachability. What do we mean by approachability? When you go up to someone and you are saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and they don't just fob you off. They're approachable. You always feel welcome. A lady was telling me that, you know what? I didn't understand it in my life, but it's like my mom didn't like me sitting on her lap. Especially when I got bigger. She would say I was too heavy and I had to just balance myself there. Then she said, but then when I went to varsity, it was, it was an odd thing for me where one of my friends, another girl, this is a girl speaking, right? A lady speaking, she would say, come, just lie with me on this bed. And she, she hugged me like this. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And she said, I'm keeping you warm. It was winter. I'm keeping you warm. She said, that was my first time having that type of experience. But it wasn't in a dubious way. She was being kept warm by someone else. So she didn't have that affection from her mother. Moms, how accessible are you to your children and how approachable are you? Or do you arrive at home and throughout the, the evening? Huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I'm listening. Pinterest. Spending that 30 minutes on Pinterest isn't going to change your life. Figuring out, who should my cupboard, should it be lime green? Let's check the pink version. Let's see. While your kids are there and they're like, mommy, mommy, mommy. On the 14th at, at the women's, women of the word, I'll be talking about managing your energy levels. That's one of the things successful women do differently. I'll be talking about time management. When we choose to do what? Amen. Amen. A mother must be accessible and approachable. Number four, identificational sacrificial love. That's the phrase I could come up with for this. The nature of a mother's love is she sacrifices for her kids. You even see it in the animal world, don't you? She sacrifices for her kids and you're blown away. You're like, huh? You spent three hours just holding that baby. Yes. Is your baby not heavy? Yes, she's heavy, but I did it. The love of a mother is sacrificial. You'll see a mom. I see it with my wife very often. No, no, don't worry about me. Let's say, let's say some kind of food we're eating runs out. You know, that happens in homes, right? You make something and then one child wants three of those items. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you're at that stage <laughs> where your kids are eating out the house. Anyway, what does mom always do? She will insist and she'll say, don't worry, my, no, I'll try and say, no, it's, oh, it's okay, you can have, uh, no, don't worry, I'll get myself something. No, don't worry. You, that's the love of a mother. It's sacrificial. And some of you grew up in homes where there was a bit of a question mark there, where you were not will, you didn't understand to what extent is my mom willing to sacrifice for me? And you know that intuitively, subconsciously as a child, you pick up on it. As a child, you pick up on it when your mom is more excited about her career than your schoolwork. Here's the principle. Children don't just listen to words. Little kids, infants, they don't just listen to words. They listen more to tone. They can pick up when you're irritated. They can pick up when you're so excited about your dreams and your ambitions because you speak with passion and it's authentic. And then when you're asking them more than two questions deep about themselves, they can see that you are half listening. Our kids sometimes say that to us. I know, Daddy. I know, Mommy. I could see you weren't really listening. They're sensitive to that. Amen? And as they grow older, it affects them. Because in their mind, they're thinking, I don't know if my stuff is really that important. I don't know how significant I am in the eyes of father or eyes of mother. And we communicate it on a daily basis through these little things that we do identificational sacrificial love in Jeremiah 50 verse 12 it says your mother will be greatly ashamed she who gave you birth will be disgraced she will be the least of the nations a wilderness a dry land a desert now when you look at certain phrases in scripture it's talking about mother in a very I'm going to use the word archetypal way 
in a very archetypal way. It's talking about mother figuratively here. And it's a mother who ends up being ashamed or disgraced based on what the child does. Because there's a strong identificational relationship between mother and child. Amen. You'll find that a child, a, a son can do all sorts of dubious things. And fathers find it easier to dissociate themselves from the son. But when you're there as a mother, it's like, but my child, how could you do that? I'm the one who raised you. You came out from me and you did that. A mother will always identify with her child. And you know what? I believe this is one of the reasons why mothers are very strong intercessors for their kids. Because the degree to which you identify with someone or something is the degree to which you become more powerful as an intercessor in that situation. Are you following? Okay. Identificational sacrificial love. You also see it with special needs children. I was speaking to someone who's from a family where they are a parent of a child with special needs. Could be handicapped. It could be a child with learning difficulties, etc. And a lot of times there's a lot of stress and strain in the marriage. And a lot of the men leave because they can't cope with the difficulty of that child. But what happens to the mother? The mother is like, this is, this is my child. And you ask the mother, because you look from the outside and you say, it must be so tough. Isn't it so tough? And she's like, you know what? Sometimes I actually forget that my child is, has got this special need. We just keep doing it. This is it. This is our life. Yes, it's tough. But this is it. It is what it is. There's something about the sacrificial love of a mother. And that's why the Bible said in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2, teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. I want to ask you, mothers in this room, are you loving your children not based on their performance, but unconditionally based on just who they are? Because the role of the mother, and it's a very strong role in those first few years of the child's life, is to reinforce unconditional acceptance. You see, often the father comes and says, how did you do at school? Did you perform? And they keep pushing you, and they play that role to stretch you. But there's something about the mother that she brings in according to God's design of, my son, whether you come last or first, my love for you will never change. I'm not saying men are not called to that, but there's a special grace in how God has wired a woman, a mother, to pass that on to her children. And if your kids don't get that, as they grow up, they become performance orientated. And be very careful because many of you, the women in this room, you're strong academically. Will you still celebrate and accept your child if they're not as strong as you? Will you still be proud of them and talk about them, choosing to speak to the treasure in their hearts and in their lives, according to how God has designed them? They might not be as athletic as you. They might not be as pretty as you. I was going to say there are many pretty women in here. They might not be as pretty as you, but I didn't want to be conning jokes, jokes, jokes. That was a joke, guys. You can laugh. They might not be as academic as you. They might not be as pretty as you. They might not be as gifted as you. But are you communicating unconditional love? And then the fifth and final one that I want to deal with is nurture and comfort. Nurture and comfort. In the book of Psalms 22 verse 9, it says, You made me hope and trust. When? When I was on my mother's breast. Do you know what breastfeeding does when there's that bond between you and your mother? It ignites in you that sense of comfort and that sense of hope that everything is going to be okay. Amen? You made me hope and trust when I was on my mother's breast. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 13 says, As a mother comforts her child... Isn't it amazing how God uses that imagery? It didn't say as a father comforts a child. It says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. If you are not comforted by your mother, God can supernaturally comfort you today. 
If you're a single mom and you can't always be there for your children, you can trust that God will supernaturally comfort them where you go to work. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. You know what I find interesting when you look at that word for love, for family type of love, that word, um, well, it's a, it's a similar, type, it's, it's a family type of love. It's called storge in the Greek. And when you look at it, it's experienced at various levels as a child is growing up in the family context. And there's a type of storge that you get from your father and there's a type of storge that you get from your mother. And children need both. And when one of them is absent, there's a wound. Because God designed it like that. And what I find interesting when you look at storge is that the nature of it is it's primarily administered in three ways. Number one, large amounts of affectionate touch. Just being touched, affection, healthy touch, that's important. Secondly, eye contact. You know, it's been found that 83% of what you learn comes through the eye gate, through what you see. What are you letting your children see? Are they seeing affection between husband and wife? Are they seeing that look in your eyes? I want to encourage you moms, have lots of eye contact with your kids. When you say you love them, look them in the eye. Ah, but you guys know I love you. When was the last time you looked at them? Eyeball to eyeball. There's so much that is communicated through the eyes. And I know that many people in this room would have grown up in families where eye contact can kind of be seen as defiance. And you just look down, just look down. Look the person in the eyes. Look them in the eye. There's so much that is communicated. Sometimes my wife will say to me, but no, I know when you are feeling tender toward me. And I say, when? When do you? What, what? She says, I can see it in your eyes. Sometimes when I'm talking to her, I'm wondering, can she see it in my eyes? <laughs> I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> right, anyway. Tone of voice. Storge is communicated through tone of voice, not just words like, I love you. Okay, I love you. What's the tone? Love you lots. What's the tone? Oh, I love you. It's one thing to say to your child, moms, okay, love you. Go now. Be good. It's another thing to say, I love you. Ooh. Do that next time. Amen. So much is communicated through tone of voice. I said to, my, to one of my, my boys when I was saying goodnight to him the other night, I wanted to practice tenderness. And I said to him, I really love you. It was Daniel. Then he says, you're starting to sound like mom. <laughs> There's something about this love of a mother. You know that scientific studies have shown that the thoughts of the mother affect the child inside the womb. I think many of you are familiar with this. And that's why next week when I talk about the sources of rejection from a mother, please come to that. Because a lot of rejection that people experience is from the womb. Let me explain something very quickly just in terms of how your brain works. The left side of your brain predominantly is the side that remembers rational things. So it remembers numbers, figures, that kind of thing. And it can be easily corrupted. That's why you can forget. You can say, hey, what's your phone number again? What's your name again? It can be easily corrupted. But in, on the right side of your brain, that's where you have emotional memories. That's where you remember feelings. And that's why you'll find that that side of the brain, it's, it's, it's almost incorruptible. It's very, very strong. And that's why you'll find if someone lost their child, a mom can say, my child died. It was a very stormy night and there was lots of thunder. And what happens whenever it's a stormy night and there's lots of thunder for that woman? She associates it with that emotion and it triggers certain things within her. And that's why when children experience abandonment and rejection, even in the womb, even from a young age, it stays in their memory bank. 
unless God intervenes and they experience healing and we'll talk about the steps to healing and that's why for some of you you're trying to connect with a woman but just that connection with a woman and wanting to be close to that particular woman you find yourself despising her and moving away from her because in your memory bank that emotion hasn't been healed yet where you associate anything feminine and anything maternal with rejection and abandonment that's why a lot of guys struggle to commit relationally to a female because of the mother wound are you following do you know that they've done experiments where you find that a little child when the mother is about to smoke yet she's a pregnant mother and she's about to smoke the heartbeat then goes up of the child because here's what happens what's passed on from mother to child is not just spirit to spirit it's not just emotion to emotion it's also chemical it's also biological they've done research where what the mom is going through in her head and her emotional state is passed on to the child so we have a lot of children today who were conceived in lust who are conceived in a shameful situation we have a lot of children today while they were in the mother's womb the mother was very anxious even in the context of marriage maybe she didn't want the child at that particular time and she got ang angry and upset and she wondered oh how do i tell my husband this he said he doesn't want more kids and so on your emotional state when you've got a child in your womb is so so important the sad thing is many times when a girlfriend or a wife is pregnant they experience rejection from the father of the child where the father of the child is saying no this is not mine let's do paternity tests let's do this let's do that and that rejection passes on from father to mother from mother to child and that's why some of the deepest healing that people need today as adults is healing with regards to what happened when they were conceived amen and watch out for this especially those of you who are firstborns firstborns you see a lot of firstborns they're like but my mother loves me a lot and everything is fine and it's all wonderful yes because they caught on nine months down the line when they saw you and there was the joy cool and they'd accepted it but what did they go through in those first few months of pregnancy when you came as a surprise are you hearing me and that's why a lot of people need healing in these particular areas our bonding with our mothers as babies will determine how we respond later in life with love or with fear with trust or with distrust at the moment of conception one becomes a living spirit and there's spirit to spirit communi communion between the mother and the child in the womb you see this nurturing love teaches children to trust are you the kind of person who's always anxious often it's because of that lack of mother child bond the mother must bring this ability this nurturing love forth you know what if this doesn't happen the child will identify very often with only masculinity and will not know or learn how to receive love and it results in fragmented relationships as i close i'm going to read out to you signs of a dysfunctional relationship with your mother and i want to pray with you if you're here this morning and you're in a space where as you think of your mom number one you're unable to communicate with her that shows there might be a wound number two her lack of respect for your choices and values you don't feel she respects your choices and values that means maybe you've never left properly three her refusal to accept your own family and friends so she smothers you that might mean that there's an unhealthy bond between you and your mom fourth a lack of freedom to have a separate life without losing her love five disconnected from her and misunderstood by her six a difficulty in saying no or in confronting her 
7. You have to hide your real self and be perfect for mom. 8. You feel responsible to make her think she's perfect. So when she says something negative about herself, you're the one who placates and you say, no, 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 mom, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Sometimes it's because as you grew up, you saw the pain she went through in how your father treated her and you became the rescuer who's always placating and you've got this responsibility in your life that I'm responsible to make mom happy. Nine, guilt when you don't take care of her as she wants you to. Ten, disillusionment and conflict over her interactions with your spouse. Eleven, guilt over not living up to her expectations and wishes. Twelve, sorrow that she can't seem to comprehend your pain. There's no bonding. There's no empathy that comes from her. It's like my mom just doesn't get it. And you feel sad. Thirteen, you're always childlike in her presence. When she comes, you become like a little boy, a little baby. You never transitioned out of the world of mother. And there's a psychology to that we might go into next week. Every man has to go through an initiation period where he actually transitions out of the world of mother into the world of true manhood. Number 14, frustration in her seeming self-absorption. Where she's absorbed with herself and you get frustrated. Like it's all about her. She's so into herself. And 15, you like crying when she treats your children in familiar, hurtful ways. How she was to you, she is now like that with your children. And then you find yourself crying in the same way that you might have cried when you were a baby. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us the blueprint. You would give us the revelation of what it truly means to be a mother. In this nation, in this time, may you show us, may you speak to your people, Lord. Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who's been wounded, Lord, who's experienced the mother wound, and, but unconditionally based on just who they are. Because the role of the mother, and it's a very strong role in those first few years of the child's life, is to reinforce unconditional acceptance. You see, often the father comes and says, how did you do at school? Did you perform? And they keep pushing you and they play that role to stretch you. But there's something about the mother that she brings in according to God's design of, my son, whether you come last or first, my love for you will never change. I'm not saying men are not called to that, but there's a special grace in how God has wired a woman, a mother, to pass that on to her children. And if your kids don't get that, as they grow up, they become performance orientated. And be very careful because many of you, the women in this room, you're strong academically. Will you still celebrate and accept your child if they're not as strong as you? Will you still be proud of them and talk about them, choosing to speak to the treasure in their hearts and in their lives, according to how God has designed them? They might not be as athletic as you. They might not be as pretty as you. I was going to say there are many pretty women in here. They might not be as pretty as you. But I didn't want to be conning jokes, jokes, jokes. That was a joke, guys. You can laugh. They might not be as academic as you. They might not be as pretty as you. They might not be as gifted as you. But are you communicating unconditional love? And then the fifth and final one that I want to deal with is nurture and comfort. Nurture and comfort. In the book of Psalms 22 verse 9, it says, You made me hope and trust. When? When I was on my mother's breast. Do you know what breastfeeding does when there's that bond between you and your mother? It ignites in you that sense of comfort and that sense of hope that everything is going to be okay. Amen? 
You made me hope and trust when I was on my mother's breast. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 13 says, As a mother comforts her child. Isn't it amazing how God uses that imagery? It didn't say as a father comforts a child. It says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. If you are not comforted by your mother, God can supernaturally comfort you today. If you're a single mom and you can't always be there for your children, you can trust that God will supernaturally comfort them where you go to work. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. You know what I find interesting when you look at that word for love, for family type of love, that word, um, well, it's a, it's a similar, t- it's, it's a family type of love. It's called storge in the Greek. And when you look at it, it's experienced at various levels as a child is growing up in the family context and there's a type of storge that you get from your father and there's a type of storge that you get from your mother and children need both and when one of them is absent there's a wound because God designed it like that and what I find interesting when you look at storge is that the nature of it is it's primarily administered in three ways number one large amounts of affectionate touch just being touched, affection, healthy touch, that's important. Secondly, eye contact. You know, it's been found that 83% of what you learn comes through the eye gate, through what you see. What are you letting your children see? Are they seeing affection between husband and wife? Are they seeing that look in your eyes? I want to encourage you moms, have lots of eye contact with your kids. When you say you love them, look them in the eye. Ah, but you guys know I love you. When was the last time you looked at them eyeball to eyeball? There's so much that is communicated through the eyes. And I know that many people in this room would have grown up in families where eye contact can kind of be seen as defiance. And you just look down, just look down. Look the person in the eyes. Look them in the eye. There's so much that is communicated. Sometimes my wife will say to me, but no, I know when you are feeling tender toward me. And I say, when? When do you, what, what? She says, I can see it in your eyes. Sometimes when I'm talking to her, I'm wondering, can she see it in my eyes? <laughs> I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> right, anyway. Tone of voice. Storge is communicated through tone of voice, not just words like, I love you. Okay, love you. What's the tone? Love you lots. What's the tone? Oh, I love you. It's one thing to say to your child, moms, okay, love you. Go now. Be good. It's another thing to say, I love you. Ooh. Do that next time. Amen. So much is communicated through tone of voice. I said to, my, to one of my, my boys when I was saying goodnight to him the other night, I wanted to practice tenderness. And I said to him, I really love you. It was Daniel. Then he says, you're starting to sound like mom. <laughs> There's something about this love of a mother. You know that scientific studies have shown that the thoughts of the mother affect the child inside the womb. I think many of you are familiar with this. And that's why next week when I talk about the sources of rejection from a mother, please come to that. Because a lot of rejection that people experience is from the womb. Let me explain something very quickly just in terms of how your brain works. The left side of your brain predominantly is the side that remembers rational things. So it remembers numbers, figures, that kind of thing. And it can be easily corrupted. That's why you can forget. You can say, hey, what's your phone number again? What's your name again? It can be easily corrupted. But in, on the right side of your brain, that's where you have emotional memories. That's where you remember feelings. And that's why you'll find that that side of the brain, it's, it's, it's almost incorruptible. It's very, very strong. And that's why you'll find if someone lost their child, a mom can say, my child died. It was a very stormy night and there was lots of thunder. 
And what happens whenever it's a stormy night and there's lots of thunder for that woman? She associates it with that emotion and it triggers certain things within her. And that's why when children experience abandonment and rejection, even in the womb, even from a young age, it stays in their memory bank unless God intervenes and they experience healing. And we'll talk about the steps to healing. And that's why for some of you, you're trying to connect with a woman. But just that connection with a woman and wanting to be close to that particular woman, you find yourself despising her and moving away from her because in your memory bank, that emotion hasn't been healed yet. Where you associate anything feminine and anything maternal with rejection and abandonment. That's why a lot of guys struggle to commit relationally to a female because of the mother wound. Are you following? Do you know that they've done experiments where you find that a little child, when the mother is about to smoke, yet she's a pregnant mother and she's about to smoke, the heartbeat then goes up of the child. Because here's what happens. What's passed on from mother to child is not just spirit to spirit. It's not just emotion to emotion. It's also chemical. It's also biological. They've done research where what the mom is going through in her head and her emotional state is passed on to the child. So we have a lot of children today who were conceived in lust, who were conceived in a shameful situation. We have a lot of children today, while they were in the mother's womb, the mother was very anxious, even in the context of marriage. Maybe she didn't want the child at that particular time, and she got ang angry and upset, and she wondered, ooh, how do I tell my husband this? He said he doesn't want more kids, and so on. Your emotional state, when you've got a child in your womb, is so, so important. The sad thing is, many times when a girlfriend or a wife is pregnant, they experience rejection from the father of the child. Where the father of the child is saying, no, this is not mine, let's do paternity tests, let's do this, let's do that. And that rejection passes on from father to mother, from mother to child. And that's why some of the deepest healing that people need today as adults is healing with regards to what happened when they were conceived. Amen? And watch out for this, especially those of you who are firstborns. Firstborns. You see a lot of firstborns, they're like, but my mother loves me a lot and everything is fine and it's all wonderful. Yes, because they caught on nine months down the line when they saw you and there was the joy, cool, and they'd accepted it. But what did they go through in those first few months of pregnancy when you came as a surprise? Are you hearing me? And that's why a lot of people need healing. In these particular areas. Our bonding with our mothers as babies will determine how we respond later in life. With love or with fear. With trust or with distrust. At the moment of conception, one becomes a living spirit and there's spirit to spirit communi communion between the mother and the child in the womb. You see, this nurturing love teaches children to trust. Are you the kind of person who's always anxious? Often it's because of that lack of mother-child bond. The mother must bring this ability, this nurturing love forth. You know what? If this doesn't happen, the child will identify very often with only masculinity and will not know or learn how to receive love and it results in fragmented relationships as I close I'm going to read out to you signs of a dysfunctional relationship with your mother and I want to pray with you if you're here this morning and you're in a space where as you think of your mom Number one, you're unable to communicate with her. That shows there might be a wound. Number two, her lack of respect for your choices and values. You don't feel she respects your choices and values. That means maybe you've never left properly. Three, her refusal to accept your own family and friends. So she smothers you. That might mean that there's an unhealthy bond between you and your mom. 
Fourth, a lack of freedom to have a separate life without losing her love. Five, disconnected from her and misunderstood by her. Six, a difficulty in saying no or in confronting her. Seven, you have to hide your real self and be perfect for mom. Eight, you feel responsible to make her think she's perfect. So when she says something negative about herself, you're the one who placates and you say, no, 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 mom, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Sometimes it's because as you grew up, you saw the pain she went through in how your father treated her and you became the rescuer who's always placating and you've got this responsibility in your life that I'm responsible to make mom happy. Nine, guilt when you don't take care of her as she wants you to. Ten, disillusionment and conflict over her interactions with your spouse. Eleven, guilt over not living up to her expectations and wishes. Twelve, sorrow that she can't seem to comprehend your pain. There's no bonding. There's no empathy that comes from her. It's like my mom just doesn't get it. And you feel sad. Thirteen, you are always childlike in her presence. When she comes, you become like a little boy, a little baby. You never transitioned out of the world of mother. And there's a psychology to that we might go into next week. Every man has to go through an initiation period where he actually transitions out of the world of mother into the world of true manhood. Number 14, frustration in her seeming self-absorption. Where she's absorbed with herself and you get frustrated. Like it's all about her. She's so into herself. And 15, you like crying when she treats your children in familiar, hurtful ways. How she was to you, she is now like that with your children. And then you find yourself crying in the same way that you might have cried when you were a baby. Let's pray.